here we are 20 years later, folks, and this was actually the greenhouse you saw, um, well, whenever, when that was made, whenever you saw it, but 20 years ago. So this was a greenhouse going up to where those glass doors are, and I and Bill walked right in this way. Come on in and take a look how things have changed. So here we are. Yeah, this was a greenhouse that Doug and I first built when we came here, and it, list, it existed for years, and it was pretty nice at that time. However, it was only a greenhouse. Eventually, I built that room, which I think was uh, shown in Global Gardener, and then more recently I've built this, and this is all pretty much out of recycled lumber that I scored right here on Orcas Island. And I've tried to, it needs some trim and some finish, but I've tried to um, have as many kinds of wood as possible. So I've got old growth dug fir, old growth red cedar, old growth yellow cedar, and some beautiful pine in here as well. And this is a nice big juniper, our native uh, Rocky Mountain juniper. So, and these are all things that just somebody gave me, and I had to rip out of a building that was going to be demolished. And there's still more to do, but you know, this is where I live. Hot water system here is coming off the wood stove, comes back into this room where, you know, my family and I live. This is the main room, wood stove here, and well, what else is there? We got a little bedroom over here. So this is kind of what that whole place has evolved to over time. Well, things have changed a lot over the years. When I first came here, it was pretty much bright and open um, all around on the top of the hill, and there's a lot more foliage now. One of our primary goals was not only food production, but also having more broadleaf foliage. If you look around at our existing uh, natural vegetation, it's largely conifers, which kind of are harsh and a little bit austere in some ways, and yet extremely resilient. We're standing under a little cherry grove. These are uh, basically seedling cherries, that uh, probably cherries that I ate, not a, that a bird dropped out, because they're good quality. They get nice and big. They're nice big red cherries. And they create a beautiful uh, little canopy here right now, and a nice uh, contrast to the surrounding vegetation. As well, right on the other side of John, is a little cherry that uh, it came up um, as a seedling, and I grafted it to a yellow cherry. So my plan for the future is that these will be kind of, uh, and the birds are going to get some of them on the tops especially. And this, because it's in close proximity, will to the birds seem not quite ripe yet. And this might have the ability to get it extremely sweet. And this is something that my family and I can really eat. So and these just kind of happened. Initially when we came here, we thought we had such fertile, moist soil down the hill. Why should we even bother with trying to plant fruit trees up here? Because it seemed like it would really be pushing, going, like going against the stream. But we started seeing seedlings a fruit tree show up, some because we threw out seeds or we ate things, and some because as we created a more diverse environment, more birds started to come in to maybe eat something else we'd planted. So here's cherries coming up here. Right here's a little plum tree. Now who would ever think of planting a plum in a place like this? It's right under a great big old massive dug fir. And this is a cherry plum, the Merovalin. Came up, I grafted it, and this is the grafted bell. And you can see it's got fruit on it. And it ripens. See, normally, when you're placing a fruit tree in a landscape, no one would ever put a fruit tree in the rain shadow and at the base of a large dug fir, but it came up by itself and it seemed to do well. I do water it occasionally, and you can see the vigorous growth, but nonetheless, it is de definitely tapped into something. So reading your landscape, understanding what maybe you've got a plan for an orchard here or there, but fruit trees can be in many um, unusual locations. But as you come right down here, you'll see here's a peach. I planted this. This is a seedling, but we planted it. This is a Siberian sea. Often used as a rootstock, but it does make a very nice peach. It's similar to uh, probably the progenitor of many peaches from Asia. And right this way, this was a seedling apple, not the not the uh, not the the crab apple, but um, the domestic apple that came up. And I, I kind of said, "Hey, what is an apple coming up here?" And one year someone even weeded it, so just clearing up the path. Well, now it's big. At first I grafted Cox's Orange Pippin, and then I grafted this other variety, Green Sleeves, which you see here. It's a very disease-resistant variety that's come out of England. Very tasty. And what I like about this tree, uh, it'd be nice if there was more um, apples on it right now, for the sake of effect, but it was not the best year for us because of rain at um, bloom time. This branch here... Um, this is the original seedling, and last year for the first time it made fruit, and it was fantastic fruit. 
It might be a seedling from a Red Delicious, which is actually not a garbage apple if you taste the original Red Delicious. So I'm thinking of saving this. So when we when we find a seedling of a um, selected apple, not the wild one, we'll often leave a branch of it or two to have a chance to exhibit its characteristics at some point in the future because after all we are involved in a breeding and selective process continually here and to simply graft it low would absolutely um, eliminate the possibility of future evaluation as well what we've got going on the hill here in a dry um, harsh very Mediterranean conditions it's it's hot it's dry the soils are thin they dry out quickly these things, the green here, is because we do irrigate. We have mixed herbs, vegetables, seasonal vegetables, especially spring greens and tomatoes, things like that. Our main crop is lower down the hill where the soils are better and there's more moisture retention. Okay, this is the cork oak. This is Corcus Suber from uh, the Mediterranean regions. And if you can look closely, this is cork. This is what they make wine corks and everything from. It, grow, it, it thrives in these kind of conditions. So. I'm not saying I'm going to harvest the cork, but I could one day. It's just, ha it's just an example of having another resource uh, available and something that I could in the future utilize if I needed to. In a, in a location like this, we're a microclimate within a microclimate. The San Juan Islands are in what is called the uh, banana belt or the rain shadow. We don't get the same rain that most of the maritime northwest does because of the proximity to the Olympic Mountains and prevailing winds. So we might get 20 or 25 inches of rain a year here. So we take that. Now we take a southern exposure with rocks that get very hot on a hot day and thin soils that are very fast draining. That 25 inches a year is a relative thing because most of that rainfall falls when the growth cycle is not happening. Most of that falls until maybe the end of March, maybe April. And a lot of plants are growing after that. So that 25 inches can be deceptive. What is it actually doing for plant growth? For, for choosing for true survivability and toughness. Finding plants from similar climates. Yeah, so Mediterranean plants are some of our finest plants for conditions like this. But interestingly enough, some of our fruit trees are about as tough if they're grown on their own root. Not a semi-dwarf, not a dwarf, but a, a seedling root, a standard tree. And that standard tree will be dwarfed by its environment and its conditions. In a bottomland soil, an apple might get 30 plus feet. Up here, you'd be lucky if it gets 20. So the conditions are going to be dwarfing. And what you see is a result of years of trial and error. Many things have failed simply because, because their water needs were excessive. And I, I'm not interested in supplying artificial irrigation to everything in the landscape around here. Our goal is not simply uh, productivity for ourselves, but it's also diversity. There's fruit trees, there's a strawberry tree here, there's an apple, that's an autumn olive, Ceanothus, another apple over there, Moroccan broom, Saskatoon.